New Jersey. She's currently in private practice with the Middle Atlantic Medical Group in Westfield, New Jersey, Dr. Fatma Nakwi. And our guest of honor is the Senior Director of the System-Wide Special Pathogens Program at New York City Health and Hospitals, where she's part of the executive leadership team which oversees New York City's response to the coronavirus disease in the city's 11 public hospitals. She was also featured in the Netflix documentary series, Pandemic, How to Prevent an Outbreak, Dr. Saira Madhid. And if you have any questions, uh, please visit our website, slido.com forward slash humfida, because we won't take any live Q&A, but you can put it into the website and we can ask Dr. Saira Madhid through that. And the comment will also be pinned on Facebook Live and YouTube. Uh, now I will uh, hand it over to Dr. Fatma Nakwi for the continuation of this program. Dr. Fatma Nakwi, everybody. Thank you so much. Um, I would like to welcome everyone to this afternoon's uh, discussion on uh, the pandemic and the world that we live in right now. Um, it is my absolute pleasure to be doing this uh, discussion with Dr. Saira Mada. Um, as you know, as it has been mentioned that she's been on uh, multiple news, uh, national news outlets and media outlets, and she's done uh, two docuseries actually. Um, the one is on discovery recently called um, the vaccine conquering COVID. Um, so I'm excited to be discussing this with her. Uh, before we get to the vaccine and the pandemic, um, I know that our audience and our viewers are in different age groups. So for the young ones that are here, I'm really interested in knowing from Dr. Mother, like how she found herself in a public health, you know, uh, role as a leader in it. So uh, Dr. Mother, how did you find yourself, you know, as a as a Southeast Asian uh, woman, I know there are only a few career options uh, growing up, you know, as like a doctor, an engineer, a lawyer. <laughs> So to find yourself in the middle of a, first of all, being a leader in a pandemic and leading this fight against it, how did you discover public health? Um, well, you know, I think for, for me, my interest started at a very young age and it actually started from Hollywood movies. I, I watched the, the movie, uh, you know, Outbreak at a very young age oh, yeah. in the 90s. And, you know, I saw these people in bubble suits and I'm like, oh my goodness, this looks fascinating. And then, you know, I had amazing teachers in, in high school that really cultivated my, you know, my interest in it. And they gave me these really interesting books like, you know, Hot Zone by Richard Preston. And that even further advanced my interest in it. But I think also being Pakistani and, and you know, being first generation here, um, parents were all about, the, you know, we want doctors in the family. We want engineers. And um, early on, I actually was looking at pursuing the field of, of medicine. I got into a six year program at Howard University and I started it. And my father was obviously elated. And I, I decided, you know what, I want to I want to go into public health, because for me, I wanted to do service at large, right. So looking at not just from an individual standpoint, but from a collective population standpoint. And so I, I, I started to, you know, pursue a field specifically in public health. And I already had that interest early on of just going into infectious diseases. And that's really kind of how it how it started for me. Um, and it just it's been one thing after another. And in this particular field, all of my colleagues that are in this were the type of people where you're silently working uh, behind the scenes and you're doing everything to not only prevent epidemic from happening, but you're also responding to it. And people don't really know public health. They don't understand public health because they're out living their daily life. But it's when there's a problem is when they realize, oh, well, what are we doing and what is public health doing? And that's when a lot of us are front and center. But that's probably not the approach we, ought, we, we won't want to take. We want to make sure that when the sky is blue and everything is going dandy, we're still investing in public health. Uh, you know, I know as our conversation goes on, we can certainly mention of how we need to change how we respond to epidemics and pandemics, what we need to do structurally and systemically, but there's just so much. Exactly. I mean, I am um, interested, you know, as a woman, like coming out in this field, what kind of challenges? I mean, I have a 16 year old daughter, you know, and she's looking to every brown, black colored woman out there as a role model, you know, um, have you, you know, how have you been navigating your role in that? It's been difficult, I think, to be very 
honest, because I was thrown into, you know, the spotlight uh, early on in this pandemic because of the docuseries. And there were people didn't really know many people that was in this particular field of pandemic preparedness and response. And so, you know, they were looking at different names. And so very early on, I kind of was was thrown into the, the media spotlight. Um, and I wasn't prepared for it, to be very honest. You know, I've done so many presentations. I've done so many different medical conferences. But being in the media and then being a science communicator required so much thought and commitment and making sure that you're obviously understanding all the difference, uh, what, what's happening all around you. And when you're in a pandemic, one thing as everybody's seeing today is the science continues to change because we're learning more about the virus itself. So to communicate that in a nuanced way, it's been difficult, but it's also been a privilege. You know, there's so many people that uh, are in the same position as me that are trying to be good science communicators. Um, it's, you know, it's, it's a privilege, but it's also, it's, it's difficult. It's an ongoing commitment. What keeps you motivated to keep going every single day? Because, you know, I will tell you as a physician, I have come across, you know, a va vaccine hesitancy. I've kind of battled uh, just in, you know, I, I'm an OBGYN, so I have pregnant women and they want to know answers, but not only that, but to know that, I personally speaking, I we've lost at least five family members to COVID, you know, um, and it's raging still, you know, it has the numbers have come down nationally tremendously, thanks to the vaccine effort. Uh, but I think I, I wouldn't be surprised if I hope to God this doesn't come true, but every household has experienced, you know, in some degree, this fashion. So how have you kept yourself, you know, staying positive, staying motivated? Yeah, so excellent question. And first, you know, my condolences to your loss. And I think that we probably ask our audience, I'm sure everybody knows at least someone even through the six degrees of separation that yes. you know somebody that has, you know, lost the battle with COVID-19. And even personally, for me, looking at friends, family, community members, it's, it's probably it's been the double, di double digits at this point. Um, and so it's affected every facet of our life. It's not just the health outcome, but it's how we function as a society. Um, and I think that first, as you've mentioned, we are seeing declines in cases, hospitalization, and death all around. But I think we also need to look at it from a lens of what is actually happening today. So while we're averaging about 70,000 new infections per day, that's still a very high number. Mm -hmm. What we also know is that number doesn't truly reflect what's actually happening in the community in terms of the you know viral circulation. You probably uh, uh, I'm sure people understand that there's probably four times that that's actually circulating in the communities. Um, but we are seeing that there is light at the end of the tunnel with the vaccines and whatnot. Um, but we are, we've been thrown a wrench with the variants. And so a lot of us obviously are keeping an eye on what these variants mean in terms of the trajectory of this pandemic. Is it going to elongate it? Is it, are we going to be in a longer period of time? Are we going to see more cases, hospitalization and death? How can we protect the most vulnerable? So these are a lot of the questions that are happening right now at the local, state, and national level. Um, but I think I think one thing to probably mention is this is absolutely you know not the time to let down any of our guards. So we are seeing these declines. There's there's still a hump that we have to to go through to get to to the other end. Um, and it's not to say that you know we're not going to go back to the you know pre-COVID days. I think that as cases are declining, as you're seeing you know severe disease decline, as you're seeing hospitalization decline, we will have public health guidance coming out shortly that talks about those that are vaccinated, what they can do. Um, and we're also seeing some really great, you know, uh, studies being conducted all around the world. And certainly we can get into some of that, that looks at not only the transmission, but how effective these vaccines are, even with the variants that are circulating. So for me, you know, what kind of motivates me to keep going is knowing that obviously not only do I have my own, my own family, but it's, it's about the greater good. It's making sure that we are trying to protect everybody and we're providing this information to everybody in a way that's culturally competent, that, you know, that is sensitive um, and that people understand, you know, why this is so important. And we know that, you know, this has, as I mentioned, affected all of us in so many different ways. And you know, one thing that I, I know I just mentioned to the, to the media is you can put any action, ver you know, um, action, you take any action verb and you put the word pandemic in it, pandemic parenting, pandemic working, it's, it's, it's transformed everything. So all of us are certainly looking forward to the days where we can see each other uh, freely in a sense, and it's going to take some time, but it's going to happen. And I think that's what motivates all of us is that COVID optimism and knowing that we're going to get eventually to that point. 
I think uh, one of the things that I noted, even myself, is hope. You know, I think vaccines brought hope back into our conversation. Whereas if you were looking back in March, when I went through COVID illness myself, you know, it's, it's just the fact that the vaccines are on the scene. And I know the Biden administration has purchased, I think, additional vaccines from Pfizer and Moderna to, I think, vaccinate about 300 million, I think. That's what they're in the US. So, and that's not even accounting for the J&J, the Oxford, uh, AstraZeneca, and the others that are probably in the pipeline. So I think it gives us hope that one day we will come out of this. Um, I don't know if we'll be, truly free, just like with measles, <laughs> rubella, you know, I don't know if we're going to get to that. I think this is here to stay. Um, but it's just a matter of navigating it. So vaccines, at least for me, it gave me hope to keep going. Um, I know that the um, our viewers are submitting questions. So I'm just going to kind of get through them as we, um, if you can just highlight how effective the vaccines have been, at least the Pfizer and Moderna, um, against the severity, or you can highlight what does it mean to have severe illness versus mild, and is it preventing acquiring an infection or just managing symptoms? Yeah, so I think the two really big points that we, you know, we look at when it comes to vaccines and in the current environment is obviously, is it preventing severe disease? And what does severe disease mean in the spectrum of illness that COVID-19 falls under? And then what does it do to transmission, right? So the, B, the big question now is, if I get vaccinated, I know I'll be protected from severe disease, I'll be protected from requiring hospitalization and then ICU level care and even protecting, you know, myself from death. But what does it mean in terms of transmission? Can I still transmit the virus if I get infected to other people? And I think there is really great news on both fronts, right? So it's always really important to, to look at the studies, see what they're showing us, and then seeing how it's actually playing, playing out in the actual real world. So when we talk about the currently authorized COVID-19 vaccines in the United States, we have some really, really great information coming out. Just as of, you know, for example, yesterday with Pfizer, yes. that's really showing us, A, when, when you look at these um, authorized vaccines and you look at the variants, right? So there's multiple variants of concern. We have at least three. But I think when we talk about variants, there's thousands of variants, um, you know, since the inception of this pandemic. And then it's three that obviously we're very worried about because they're more transmissible, they can result in, you know, severe disease uh, and, and the like. Um, and if you're comparing the variants and the effect they have on the vaccines, certainly the vaccines have taken a hit in terms of its overall efficacy. But when you look at it, preventing severe disease, hospitalization and death, that's where it counts. Those are where the endpoints are. And they are still significantly protective on all of them. And in fact, if you look at the data, people that actually have gotten the COVID-19 vaccines. And when you look at it from the backdrop of the variants, it's still protecting them from se severe disease. You haven't seen anybody, you know, in that severe disease category requiring hospitalization and death. And that's really what's really, really important about it. Um, so I think on that point and on that front, that's really, really great news. Now on the second is in terms of transmission. So now that I've gotten the COVID-19 vaccine and both of them, right, to get full protective immunity, what does that mean in terms of transmission? Can I transmit it to others and, and the like? And again, really great studies coming out from, from Israel. We are seeing studies come out from other countries that is showing, you know, the, the lower transmission that's happening in vaccinated people. Um, and that's really, really great news. And you're seeing the transmission, you know, basically reduced by a significant amount. And again, these are observational studies but it's showing what we have anticipated already is that uh, people that have been vaccinated can spread the virus quite less. Um, and even if they do get it, they're asymptomatic. And when they are asymptomatic, their viral load is quite reduced. And when we talk about viral load and what that means in disease and disease severity, you're seeing that lower viral, viral loads translates into lesser disease severity, as well as transmitting it to others. So on that front, really, really great news. So um, because just to kind of use layman's terminology, so I got the vaccine um, and I actually did get it. I completed my course <laughs> 10 days ago. So does it mean that I can just go out there, you know, okay, fine, I'll wear the mask, but can I go and see my mom? You know, I haven't hugged her in over a year, you know, can my children go visit their, you know, nani and daddy and whatever. So does, is that where we are now? If we, you know, obviously our community, it's a joint family system. Yeah. You know, the Southeast Asian community is that. So what do you, how do you respond to that? 
So I think there's a couple of different things. So first, when you're looking at the interaction between vaccinated people, so if somebody is vaccinated and they're planning interacting with another person that's vaccinated, then that's completely fine in terms of doing it without masks, you know, indoors, things like that. But then when you um, start to interact with individuals that are non-vaccinated, that's when you want to continue to take the precautions, even though we have some of these really great studies until public health guidance changes and the policy changes based on what we're finding. That's where we want to continue to follow the science uh, and the evidence. But in terms of, you know, obviously seeing, uh, you know, people that have been vaccinated, really, really great news on that front. And there is actually some really great publications by some of my colleagues that actually show you these are the things that you can do if you're vaccinated. Um, and so I think it's really impor important to not obviously undersell the vaccines because, you know, we know this is the way out of this pandemic. And it's not to say that you have to continue to wear a mask, but right now the reason why is because we're learning more about the overall transmission. We want to get to a point where you have more people obviously vaccinated in the community, either through vaccination or obviously through naturally acquiring, which is already happening. And we're getting that getting there faster than we actually even think. What do you think is happening in the, um, cause you do, you're in New York city, right? So what have you seen a lot of vaccine hesitancy in the Southeast Asian community? Have you found a lot of barriers? Cause where I am, where I'm actively practicing, I have a lot of African-American women and there's a distinction to, clearly, you know, I have to talk more, convince more versus, you know, my other uh, patients. So have you found that to be true? So certainly we are seeing vaccine hesitancy, but I think that as the days progress, you're seeing less. So you're seeing more people interested to get the COVID-19 vaccine. And that's really just a testament of having trusted messengers working at the community level. But I think a really big part of that is access to these vaccines, right? So for example, an individual is interested in getting vaccinated. What you're seeing, for example, in New York City is almost 500,000 people don't have internet access. And the way you get a vaccine is by making an appointment going online, right? One of the the... the the primary means. And so you're seeing uh, a number of people that are interested, but they just can't actually you know, make an appointment and get to the point of getting the vaccine administered because of the low hanging fruit challenges that we have from the IT system to you know having a car service and then taking you to uh, the vaccine appointment and things like that. And so there's a huge emphasis of making sure that we are reducing as num you know a number of barriers in terms of access to the vaccines. So that's one, part of vaccine hesitancy, I think. But it, and in terms of those people that are doing the wait and watch approach, you know, and there's a lot of people in, in that particular category, even healthcare workers. And I can say in New York City, for example, you're seeing some healthcare systems earlier on have a wait and watch approach or a refusal approach of about 30%. Um, and that's just because, you know, they want to they wanna see more data and more data is coming out of, you know, looking at the transmission effectiveness of against these variants and things like that. So I think it's a lot about obviously providing that information that people are seeking to ensure they're making informed decisions. But I think the other really important thing, and I think CDC has done a really great job in trying to articulate this, is that the, the decision to get vaccinated is not, you know, um, a one and done type of conversation. It's a continuum, right? So you're going to continue to work towards educating that individual, informing them of the facts, ensuring that all their questions are answered and making sure that they understand why this is important because not getting vaccinated is not a risk-free choice, right? People oftentimes don't really get the point of that, but not getting vaccinated is not a risk-free choice. And so making sure you're understanding it from an empathetic way, you're addressing the concerns, it's going to take time, but it's on that spectrum. And I think, um, um, and I actually just tweeted about this of, of, a, of an individual in UK and the way that she mentioned it, and I really liked it is, you know, you, we should look at vaccines as an evergreen approach, right? So we're offering you the vaccine today that offer is going to continue to stand. So we want to make sure that we're constantly chipping away and making sure that you understand why this is important and addressing your concerns and that you get to the point where you feel comfortable getting the COVID-19 vaccine. Yeah, I think that's, um, you make, that, that was an excellent point. It's always available, you know, even though, you know, it's from, it was initially rollout was like, it's voluntary. But honestly, sometimes I think about, you know, how vaccines came out and how, why is there so much, you know, questions about the vaccine? I don't think we have a question how other vaccines were developed, because this is happening in our lifetime, you know, we're actually seeing the process as it's, I think the more questions are being uh, arisen and, you know, pa patients are asking questions and you're like going step by step. And I try to tell them it's actually we're living in it. We're, you're in history, you're making history right now. So, you know, um, one of the questions, you know, that I'm, that I, I hope that you can answer for me as well is that, 
in pregnancy, because I know the initial studies excluded pregnant women and breastfeeding women, um, for obvious reasons, mm -hmm. you know, they don't want to expose, but uh, we won't get into that whole political <laughs> conversation about pregnant and yeah. breastfeeding moms, why they're excluded from studies. But um, how do you do you have any data using the dart? You know, like, do you have anything that you can shed light on? Maybe there are women in the community who are pregnant and thinking about getting it. Yeah, so I think uh, when it comes to the COVID-19 vaccine and pregnancy and those that are lactating first, as you've mentioned, you know, there's not a lot of safety data, but there's good news on that front. And, and I'll start with what we know. So first, what we know, and, and then I'll tell you what's happening right now. So what we know is, you know, both Pfizer and Moderna did, as you mentioned, these DART studies. So these de the developmental and toxicity studies on animal models, rats, and these rats were pregnant and lactating, and they have shown no adverse side effect to, you know, the mother and, and the, and the mm -hmm. Second, um, when they were enrolling, uh, you know, participants in the clinical trials, they obviously had the exclusion criteria of they didn't want to have pregnant lactating females. That's not to say that once these, uh, the women were enrolled, enrolled, they did not get pregnant. Right. And then in fact, you did see um, both in Pfizer and Moderna in the uh, clinical trial participants, the volunteers, you did see a handful of women did get pregnant. Um, and so based on some of that information, we're also seeing that there were no adverse side effects reported. And now coming into the real world, a number of pregnant um, you know, women and lactating females, me being one of them, I got my COVID-19 vaccine and I'm a, you know, a breastfeeding mother, you're seeing some of the studies and follow up on that. And again, very, very promising. In fact, you're seeing, uh, you know, studies that show that, for example, for lactating females, you're seeing antibodies being passed in the breast milk. I'm actually even part of a Mount Sinai study for the past eight months, where I collect my breast milk and I send it to Mount Sinai. Uh, and they analyze it and they're looking at it as a form of therapeutic. Um, and so really, really great information on that front. Now, getting to what's happening now, um, on Thursday, Pfizer made an announcement that they actually started uh, phase two, three clinical trials on, I think about 4,000 uh, pregnant uh, yeah. women. Um, so we're going to get some really great information on that front. So obviously getting a COVID-19 vaccine, if you're in that situation is a personal choice. And it's a choice that you're making based on first, you know, your level of health, any comorbidities, you're also looking at your exposure risk. So for example, if you're a person that's working in the community, your risk of contracting COVID-19 is much, much higher than obviously staying home. And then it's obviously a risk benefit analysis and then it's a discussion with your healthcare provider. And as more information is obviously made available, you know, you're know, you able to see uh, a lot of the great data that, that is coming out. Um, there is actually a really great decision support tool um, that a, a colleague, I think in Boston made, and it really tells you, you know, this is information we know. And if you're in this situation, you know, perhaps you should get a COVID-19 vaccine now versus have that wait and watch approach. And I can certainly share that with you. And I've been sharing that with, with others that are, you know, in this particular category. But I think it's also important to know that the studies do show, and actually the one I think just three days ago that was just released shows that um, pregnant females are at higher risk for severe disease, oh. higher risk for mechanical ventilation, are at higher risk for death compared to non-pregnant uh, women. So I think if you take all of that information, again, it's a risk benefit analysis that everybody's doing on a personal scale. I agree. I mean, when I have a conversation with our patients, you know, I always tell them that pregnancy, you know, you will not, hopefully you get the mild version or mild disease, but it does not mean that it actually you are in a higher category that you will come down with severe disease. And what that means is an ICU admission going to the hospital requiring services. So, you know, I always mention to them when I'm having that conversation that, you know, I rather you get the vaccine, which I think a lot of it is also like how it was developed, you know, back to our earlier conversation, you know, oh, it's going to go into the DNA. Oh my God, it's a new technology. How is this going to, you know, and that's just has not panned out to be true. So it is a safe vaccine as far as we know. And of course, more data is coming in. Um, speaking of children, well, uh, you know, schools are big. I don't know about New York City, but in New I'm ready. I'm ready for kids to go back to school. <laughs> <I'm with you. laughs> I, am, I don't know how we did it, but yeah. we are here a year later, you know, and I'm ready. Um, you know, my 16 year old loves her virtual format, but my other two boys, you really need to go back. So where do you think we're going, you know, with, um, you know, I know Biden's got his agenda for 100 days and what does it mean for schools to be open? But what is your opinion on it? Do you think we can get there by September? I'm not even thinking about spring. I'm thinking about September. 
September. No, absolutely. So, you know, CDC did release kind of this color coded guideline of, you know, based on community transmission and, and where, you know, um, states fall under, communities fall under in terms of opening in person, hybrid um, or remote. And unfortunately, as we know, and, and again, this is all based on science data and, and following this information, is that while you may have high levels of community transmission in the community, it's really different of what's happening in schools because what you're looking at is kind of a 2M approach. It's, you know, it's monitoring and it's mitigation. When we talk about mitigation, it's that risk reduction. It's layering on approach of obviously making phys make sure there's physical distancing, there's masking, you know, there's obviously good ventilation, cleaning, things like that. All those things matter. Um, and then the added layers that they've put on in terms of testing and vaccination of um, teachers mm -hmm. and staff. Um, and I think there's a lot, obviously, to, to talk there, but I think just bottom line, and I can get a little bit more into it, is schools certainly can open safely, regardless of the amount of community transmission happening, if you take on approaches that are not only just school-based and making sure you're abiding by the mitigation strategies, but you also have a community and you have community-based strategies, right? And what I mean by that is we need to prioritize, obviously, schools need to be open, and if you're having high rates of community transmission, then you shouldn't have bars open, right? So you need to look at and triage what you need to do to reduce transmission. This is not, you know, we're not in the early days, days of this pandemic where we were really functioning blindly. We didn't know about the transmission-based dynamics of this disease. We didn't know what measures to take to reduce re reduction uh, or, or transmission of this virus. We know so much. So, you know, when a lot of us go on the media and we talk about what we don't know, but we do know a lot. Right. We know about um, how COVID-19 functions, how it spreads. So we can take these strategies, but it also comes from a school based approach. It also comes from a community based approach. The other thing that I'll just quickly mention is the really big uh, topic right now is vaccination, obviously, and, and offering vaccinations to, to teachers. And absolutely, we want to prioritize uh, mm -hmm. teachers and staff that are in these schools to be part of that priority group. But as you know, across the United States, each state is so different in who they're expanding eligibility to. So just, you know, as of yesterday, close to 30 states are offering, um, you know, COVID-19 vaccines to teachers, not all 50 states. So it's really different on, on the approach that's being taken. And that's why you want to make sure that we're following it from a lens of a national uh, approach, if you will. But it's such a hot topic. But yeah. I both being a parent, I certainly support kids being back in school through ensuring we have these mitigation measures in place. Right. I'm going to just get to some of the questions that the audience is asking. Um, just I don't want to leave any question unanswered. So um, one of the questions is, are kids required to be vaccinated? I think they mean as part of their, I think, vaccine schedule. I think, you know, how we get age wise. I think that's what they're asking. So we don't have a COVID-19 vaccine for children um, right now, but both Pfizer and Moderna and other um, vaccine uh, from school companies are in active trials looking at uh, children and would be called these de-escalation trials. So right now they're, you know, I, th I think the youngest right now is from like uh, 15 to, uh, to 17. And then from there, they're gonna go on in terms of going down in age. Um, and so all of these are being planned. So the key question is when do we expect a vaccine made available for children over the age of 15? Again, it'll actually likely be sometime this year. Um, and because the trials are, are going and we'll get some good data and if all goes well, we may have a, a vaccine for children and, and the younger population probably won't be until 2022. So the question is, is it going to be required, right? Right now, COVID-19 vaccines are not required on any front. So that's not going to, that's probably not going to be the case. Okay. So another question is, and this is the one that I get all the time as well is, should individuals who've had an infection with COVID, should they still get the vaccine or is there natural immunity enough? You know, so for instance, I had COVID in March, I ended up getting it right after risk and benefit analysis for myself. So what does a layman person do? Do they, is that enough or no? So, you know, we, the, the guidance that is out from a public health standpoint is even if you have had COVID-19 is to still get vaccinated because we're looking at vaccinations providing consistent level of immunity. Um, mm -hmm. So with natural infection, immunity can wane from person to person over time. And so based on some of these studies, you know, uh, you're seeing that information. So certainly you should still get vaccinated. And I myself actually in April, you know, I, I got COVID-19 and there are some studies now, and again, this hasn't translated into change of public guidance that shows that after getting, um, you know, so we obviously have two doses, right? So the first dose is a primer, second by the, uh, followed by the boost. So people that actually have natural infection with 
three studies right now are showing is that the natural infection is ser serving as the primer and getting the first dose is serving as the boost. And so there may be a change potentially in, in, in public policy moving forward, but right now it's still important to follow that two dose regime to get that full protection based on some of the studies that we're seeing. Okay. Um, one of the other questions that I have is um, travel. You know, half the family lives in Pakistan, India, or somewhere else across the world. So I got my vaccine. I'm good to go. I did my two courses. And one of the questions is, you know, can we travel domestically, internationally? Are we ready? Yeah, it's a great question. And I think when we look at it from, from the domestic standpoint, and then we talk about it from the international standpoint, here in the United States, you know, once you're vaccinated and you get that full you know, you know, protection after waiting that 10 to 14 days after a second dose, certainly your chances of having severe disease, hospitalization, death is, is, is very, very remarkably reduced, almost 100% really. Um, and so on that front, certainly can you travel and, and do, you know, and participate in some of these higher risk activities? Um, nationally, you know, it, you're seeing it'll be okay for you to travel and do some of these things and still take, you know, additional layers of precaution. Um, and that's because here, we're probably reached a, a point where you have, um, you know, a good number of, of folks either getting obviously um, immunized through vaccination, and I apologize, my computer just uh, went to sleep. <laughs> so I don't know if you can see. <laughs> okay, all right. I wasn't. Uh, um, but when we come to the international landscape, that's very different because as you know we have uh this approach in high income countries and in fact the data as of yesterday is you know uh when you're when you're looking at uh the vaccination efforts happening in countries today right you're seeing that uh, a handful of countries right so about 10 countries uh, are using up 75 percent of the available COVID-19 vaccines right and about 130 nations haven't even started their vaccination exactly Mm -hmm. And actually, I think as of yesterday, about 87 countries only have started their COVID-19 vaccination programs. So there's a long way to go from an international standpoint where we're able to provide that level of immunity and protection to everybody. So that's going to really change generally, you know, the international uh, landscape of, of traveling. So, you know, there's more to come uh, on that. But certainly, I think that we'll get to a point where it, it'll, it'll be safe through many of these re risk reduction strategies that are being taken. Yeah. I agree. Um, back to the kids, one of the viewers just asked, um, and this is a very good one. When do children with special needs, when should they get the vaccine? So I think special needs is a big category. So let's, uh, let's clarify that with the, how about a physical disability, you know, some, you know, or um, not just, you know, neurological, you know, ADHD, we're talking about physical needs. When do you think they will be ready? Well, you know, I think when we have a vaccine made available for children, it'll always come with guidance of who can get the vaccine, what the inclusion criteria is, what the exclusion criteria is, along with who's going to be prioritized for, uh, for the vaccine. And so these deliberations happen at the public health scale with career scientists that look at the data and they're able to provide this, this information, just like they did for the COVID-19 vaccine for adults, where they prioritize you know, looking at who is at higher, highest risk and then going on from there. So that's really a, a, an answer that we'll get from our public health colleagues and agencies in the future once we have uh, a safe and effective vaccine made available. Okay, so um, I know we discussed a lot about um, the vaccines. I just want to know, um, I know that we're coming up to an hour mark, but you know, this is what you do, public health advocacy. You're coming up with a game plan of how to ca combat the next pandemic. You know, we've been here before. We've done the SARS. We've done the Middle East, right? We've done the swine flu. We've done, you know, we're not even going to go 100 years ago with the Spanish flu. But, you know, what things have you learned or what steps are going to be taken? Because here we are a year later. And I want to know, I know you can't see into a crystal ball. But like, what steps are we headed towards? How have we changed things? I know I asked 10 questions in just one <laughs> sentence. But... <laughs> sure. Uh, well, you know, given that we're still responding to this pandemic, there's a lot that's happening right now. So I think the first is how can we sustain the gains, right? So yeah. how can we sustain this level of infrastructure that we've built around response to COVID-19. And again, I think first it's from a domestic standpoint, and then it's looking at the international standpoint and both go hand in hand right so we live in a globalized world you can have the best system in place here in the US 
But if you're not looking at it from a global health security lens, well, you know that an outbreak that can start in a remote village, uh, you know, in, in Africa can be all continents all around the world in just a matter of, you know, 30, less than, you know, 38 hours or so. Um, and so really, really important to take that global health lens. But I think right now, when I talk about from a domestic standpoint, there's a few things, right? So first, uh, I think starting off over the past 40 years, we've seen a fourfold increase in the number of emerging pathogens from, as you mentioned, SARS, MERS, Ebola, Zika, all these different infectious diseases. So we know that these events are going to happen, right? We know that we're going to have more events in the future. So what can we do to prevent a local hazard from becoming a full-blown global emergency, right? And that's where it starts, right? It starts at the local level where you have an outbreak and then it goes from an epidemic to a pandemic. And so what can we do? What systems can we put into place now to ensure we're preventing the next pandemic? How can we make society more pandemic proof, if you will? And there's so much into that. And I'll just highlight a few things, right? So the first is, and then actually I have a publication coming out uh, in the next few days uh, in the Lancet with a colleague, Dr. Craig Spencer. And if you, if that name rings the bell, he was our, um, uh, our confirmed Ebola patient in New York City. He was treated at one of our hospitals in Bellevue. And I'm actually, and I, and I took this quote here and I'm gonna just quickly read it and I'll follow up on it. Yeah we wrote in this uh, in this particular Lancet article, one paragraph is that uh, there's clear financial uh, benefits to pr prioritizing preparedness when it comes to epidemics and pandemics. Since October of 2020, the COVID-19 pandemic has an interim economic tag of $16 trillion just here in the United States. That's how much it's cost us since October, right? It's not even factoring months after that in the US. So had we invested just an additional $5 per person annually in preparedness to epidemics and pandemics. At a domestic level, if we invested $1.6 billion and on an international level, $39 billion, it would have taken 970 years to spend as much on investing in global preparedness as the US is hemorrhaging in the response to COVID-19, right? So that shows you that there's a huge benefit in preparedness. So what does preparedness mean and what can we do? So the, there's a couple of things that I'll just quickly mention. The first is our entire strategy to epidemics and pandemics has been just in time, right? So just in time, we'll ramp up public health workforce, we'll ramp up contact tracing, just in time, we'll ramp up testing and genomic surveillance, just in time, we'll develop more PPE or try to get more PPE. And that has put us in a situation where we're always behind the eight ball, we're two steps behind the virus, when we obviously need to be two steps ahead. To pivot our entire strategy from a just in time, because that doesn't work, to a just in case. And what does that mean? Just in case means we know we're going to be in this situation again. So, what can we do just in case it happens? So, we need to have better systems in place. We need to have a better infrastructure in place. We need to sustain these systems to ensure that when you have another event, you can turn on these companies that can manufacture vaccines right away, not a year out. Things like that. The other thing that I'll just quickly mention is that in the United States, we pay a lot in healthcare, right? When you look at high income, you know, countries, and I'm sure, you know, you being a provider, you are so intimately aware of the cost of healthcare services. But healthcare service uh, price tag is based on responding to the case, right? It's based on treating patients. We don't invest entirely enough in prevention, right? So we need to shift from a primary care prevention standpoint. And we need to do that by ensuring that a people make healthier choices, and we're reducing the barriers where they can access these services preventatively. So there's a lot that really needs to happen. And I'm just giving you two, but there's so much. Right. More. The last I'll mention is that we need to stop the cycle of panic and neglect. And the one thing that I'll mention on that, and this is what I wrote in the op ed uh, in December, uh, basically four days before the World Health Organization was notified of the, you know, of what we're experiencing today and COVID-19. And I co-authored that with my colleague, Ron Klain, who is the chief of staff to President Joe Biden now. And what we wrote is that we need to stop the cycle of panic and neglect. We had an infrastructure here in the United States that we was going up for renewal for more funding. Right. All the 6,000 hospitals in the U.S. were getting funded for epidemic and pandemic response. And it was, uh, it was gonna be up in May and June for Congress to renew funding. And that never really happened uh, besides 10 centers and, and NETAC. Um, and so we need to stop the panic and neglect where we panic, we throw in money and then we ne neglect it, we take the money away. And when there's a problem again, it, it's a, the cycle that we're in. So we need to sustain the funding and sustain the infrastructure that we have today and so much more, but I'll stop there. 
No, no, no. I, um, this is a fascinating discussion for me because I just actually read in Bloomberg Business uh, News, they actually had a five point plan. You know, it's more just like what you just said, pathogen surveillance, like looking out for emerging pathogens, having some sort of a global infrastructure, uh, not a dub- like giving more teeth to WHO, you know, um, mm-hmm. genomic sequencing and logistics, you know, look what just happened with Texas. Um, This week, you know, the vaccines were like the supply chain just interrupted for New Jersey, you couldn't immunize anybody. So, um, so I agree, you know, I look forward to reading in Lancet, you said it's coming out this week. It's coming out this week. Yeah, yeah, Yeah. I'm happy to definitely share that. And the one thing that I'll just quickly mention, global health scale, it should never take a whistleblower to tell the world that we're in a pandemic. And that's exactly what had happened in COVID-19. It took a Chinese provider a whistleblower to tell the world what we're in and then unfortunately died from COVID-19. And that we should definitely absolutely change uh, you know, our response and notifying the world, right? So you absolutely. can't hide these things, right? You cannot hide these things. And I think the one thing that I'll mention is oftentimes when you look at countries, it's not what they say, it's what they do. If you, are, if you see they're going in lockdown, but they're saying <laughs> it's a virus that doesn't transmit human to human, you know there's a disconnect there, right? Sure. So it's what they're doing, and as they say, actions speed lo- they speak louder. Words. And so we need to change that entire dynamic there. Exactly. I'm going to get to a few more questions because yeah, sure. they're just now coming in because you know the hour is up. So here we go. Yeah. <laughs> Rapid fire. Um, what? Um, how much research is on the new variants? And you kind of touched upon this. Um, are the current vaccines effective towards the new variants? And what about traveling abroad and coming back to the US given those new variants? You know, I think you touched upon it. If you can just quickly answer that one. Yeah, I know, absolutely. So, you know, right now with the authorized vaccines, we have certainly, uh, when you look at it from a variant standpoint, they're still accomplishing the endpoint, preventing severe disease, hospitalization, and death. So they're very, very efficacious. So the worst co- worst case scenario, and this is what's there's so many studies and all are on this, even from obviously from a national standpoint, is what is our plan B, right? And so we know right now these are the variants we're concerned with. That's not to say we're not going to have more. We are going to have more variants come up. And what does that mean to the vaccines we have today? Because again, when we're immunizing the US population, we're not even factoring the international population, right? Everybody else in the world. And variants are, can arise any, everywhere, right? So when variants arise in other countries that are seeing ongoing cases, we're absolutely going to see an impact here in the US. So what's our plan B? And pharmacy companies are looking at plan B. They're making boosters. They're reform, reformulating their vaccines right now. Um, and so the US government is heavily invested in that right now. Right. Um, and then is it the vaccine efficacy? Is it the same in a 80 year old woman versus a 25 year old woman? You know, it's one of the questions is compared to elderly versus healthy. And if not, what do precautions to elderly women need to take after getting vaccinated? Yeah, so if you're looking at the clinical uh, trial data, so first you saw really great robust efficacy of you know, um, with all age groups, all ethnicities, all backgrounds, which is great. But certainly we know that elderly people obviously have, don't have a much of a robust immune response as, as healthier individuals. Um, but I think very similarly, it's still going to prevent you from having that severe outcome that we're looking at. But, you know, without really giving you the hard, the numbers, because the numbers are a little bit different from both studies. Um, I think, again, the end point is preventing severe disease, hospitalization. You're seeing that both in the young population and in the older population. Okay. And then uh, going back to travel, um, as I suspected, this was going to be with all of us, we're ready to get out of our houses is, uh, is it safe for children to travel um, if they can't wear a mask? So I think they mean travel in an airplane. Let's just take that scenario. Yeah. So I think personally, from my own standpoint, would not do that, right? Uh, first, you know, we want to take as many risk reduction measures as, as possible. And the way the way that I, I'll probably preface it by saying that is that we never want to put ourselves in a situation where we're at higher risk of getting COVID-19. There may be chance, there may be uh, certain circumstances where we have to put ourselves in a higher risk situation. I have to go to the doctor's office. I know it's a, a, a closed space. I know there's going to be people there, but that's when you're going to take these risk reduction strategies. I'm going to wear a mask. I'm going to make sure I keep my distance. I'm going to make sure that, you know, uh, I'm being cognizant of those around me, things like that. I'm, I'm doing respiratory etiquette, all those risk reduction measures that we constantly talk about. 
So that's one thing to lower your risk of transmission. But when you're doing it in a sense where you want to travel for a leisure in a time where you know we are seeing a number of these variants arise, that's a that's a personal decision, obviously, that everybody's making for themselves. But for me, I, I wouldn't do that. What do you say? Um, and this is not a question, but I'm sure it'll, we'll have one. But about double masking, you know, I actually started telling my pregnant woman to uh, if they can afford it to start purchasing like a medical grade or a surgical mask yeah. versus yeah. a cloth mask, because um, knowing I know a mask, number one, please wear a mask. Okay, that's whatever kind of mask, just wear yeah. one. Number two, I've been kind of been promoting more of a medical grade or a surgical mask, um, provided they have a good seal. So they don't have to do the two masks. But I have seen patients come in as soon as the CDC guidelines came out, you know, they're wearing the surgical mask and on top of it. Can you comment on that? Yeah, so, um, you know, because of the variants, because of ongoing transmission, the guidance that CDC has is a bit nuanced. I think that's important to for people to, to understand that what they're looking at when it comes to masks is fit infiltration. So if you have one mask that is a good mask, and not all masks are created equal, and I'm sure everybody knows that by now. So if you're wearing a good quality mask, like let's just say KN95, and I actually encourage elderly at least to make sure that they're wearing a KN95 mask, not a counterfeit one. There's so many counterfeits as yes. you sure you're so well. Yes. Um, uh, so where, so do you need to do a double mask on top of KN95? Absolutely not, right? That's a really good quality mask. Now, if you want to do a double mask, right, you want to do uh, a surgical mask on top of cloth mask. You don't want to do two surgical masks, right? Because you're looking at breathability as well. But the CDC guidance really looks at, as I mentioned, fit infiltration. So you can accomplish that by one mask or you can accomplish that by doubling the mask, or you can have a brace, right? So the whole thing is making sure there's no leakage of air around. And so it's getting that good seal. So they have these braces as well that you can put on top of one layer mask uh, or one mask with the multiple layers, but certainly double masking is, is a good idea, but wearing it with a cloth mask with a, a you know medical grade uh, surgical mask. Right. Um, oh, one of the other question is, is masking here to stay? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a great question, right? And so even when this pandemic ends, and it will end, right, it's the, every pandemic ends, you look at history, yeah. we've gone through so many different epidemics and pandemics before, and they will end. That's not to say that the COVID-19 virus is going to disappear forever. It's mm -hmm. going to be endemic, it's going to be with us, with us, we're going to be living with COVID-19. But obviously, just like we live with other diseases, right, that are out in the world. Now, I think mass is going to be a personal choice at that point, once the pandemic has ended, and we get to a point where you know, we can, you know, um, loosen a lot of these restrictions. I think people are personally going to still continue to wear a mask in some of these high risk settings, just because I think that we know that it's not just COVID-19, it's so many other respiratory viruses. And we know that they work for other different diseases. So I think if you're looking at it from a standpoint of I'm wearing it because of the pandemic, when can I take it off? Certainly we'll get to a point where that's going to happen once we have more data, once we get to a point where we know we have good uh, you know, population wide uh, immunity through natural infection, through vaccination, things like that. But then also looking at it from a personal choice, you know, I'm sure I think just like in the South in the, in the Asian countries, people continue to wear a mask regardless of what's happening. So I think that's going to be something that you're just going to be used to. It's going to be part of the new norm. Yeah, absolutely. I know that um, I don't know how much you can um, answer this question that one of the viewers asked is, you know, long term effects of COVID illness, you know, um, there's, I know there's whole blog set up to this. And there is actually very good data coming out regarding these long haulers, you know, that's what they're called. Yeah. Um, so can you comment about that? You know, so I think our community needs to understand that this is not just a mild respiratory illness. This is not just a cold that you get, it actually has ramifications and consequences long term. So they understand the severity of why we're here, you and I talking about yeah, this right yeah. now. So that's an excellent question. And I actually published on this um, a few weeks ago, and I talked about COVID-19 recovery uh, centers that we have in New York City and in the healthcare system I'm part of. There's three that we have in some of the hardest hit neighborhoods. But I think um, what I'll first mention is going back to the point I made earlier, not choosing not to get vaccinated is not a risk-free choice. And when I mean it's not a risk-free choice is if you choose to get the COVID-19, if you choose to potentially, you know, just naturally get the COVID-19 infection, right? People often look at it as, well, a lot of people don't die from it, right? If you look at the stats and the case fatality rate, 
But death is not the end point, right? So as we really, if we talk about long COVID, you're seeing that even people that have mild cases of COVID-19, even those that are, that are potentially asymptomatic and the whole spectrum of illness that COVID-19 falls under, you're seeing that it puts these individuals at higher risk for other health conditions. It puts them at, at higher risk for renal disease, lung disease, heart disease. And you're seeing more and more studies show that. Um, and you're actually seeing people, uh, you know, about a third of people that have had COVID-19 are experiencing long symptoms of it. So mm-hmm. this definitely is not a disease to play with. It's not a disease where we're saying it's like the flu or the common cold. It's very, very different. We're learning more and more about it. And you're seeing some of these rehab recovery centers set up for this purpose because it's a significant problem. That's going to be the epidemic we're going to face. When COVID-19, the pandemic is over with, you're going to see an epidemic of long haulers. And we're going to have much more information uh, at that point. Um, and we have more information now, but it's a, certainly it's a, it's a big problem. Yeah, absolutely. I think just to, I know we're coming up um, to our mark here, but one of the questions is I always love having um, young viewers ask the question. Um, so there must be somebody who's thinking about going in, you know, medical school, pre-med. So any advice for current medical students or those looking to do pre-med to go into your public health advocacy? Yeah, I mean, I work with so many different colleagues that are MD, MPs, or just MD, and they obviously are in the field of public health. So public health is such a broad field. And I think obviously having that core foundation, having that core uh, knowledge of, of medicine and healthcare goes a really, really long way. So we absolutely want to make sure that we have more people going into the field of medicine, have more people going into the field of public health, because we need to pass on the battalion, we need to pass on the mantle. Uh, mm-hmm. These are problems that we're facing today that we're going to continue to face you know, 10, 20, 30 years from now. Um, and I think the one thing that I'll just quickly mention, and I'll put a plug, plug in is when I started this field, there weren't a lot of women first, uh, you know, that will look like me in this particular field. And there wasn't a lot of uh, women or just people in the field of special pathogens, because that's my particular interest. It's highly infectious diseases, not just public health generally, but in this particular field. So I started an internship program for the program that I oversee and I run, and it's open to um, students from throughout the world. And actually I have four uh, special pathogen interns at any given time. Um, and I have folks that are pre-med in med school, post-med school that have gone through the program. Um, and they're, you know, basically, you know, you have an option of remote uh, doing their internship remotely or on site uh, for about at least three months at a time. So I have this internship that I built from the ground up for the reason to ensure that people know this field exists, they can get a taste of it, they can have some experience, and then hopefully it'll spark their interest to get into this field of highly infectious diseases. So I have that internship for if, if anybody is interested and it is a highly competitive program. We have applicants from throughout the world and we only select about three or four at a, at a time, but certainly, you know, uh, that's a, a how, uh, which, how did you, can you just give me a little bit more information about yep. the internship? I'm sure people are writing furiously down. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, um, so first, where can you find more information on it? If you go to New York City Health and Hospitals, you know, dot, uh, dot org, um, you'll see on the bottom, one of the, I play multiple different hats within the system. So not only do I lead the special pathogens program, I also lead the Institute for Diseases and Disaster Management so you'll see a link on the bottom for the Institute for Diseases and Disaster Management. When you click on it, you'll see an internship option. And then it gives you the information of um, how you can apply, you know, what we'll need in terms of uh, to apply and things like that. But it is open all year round for, for students that are um, over undergrad, grad, postgrad. Okay, excellent. Um, I have time for two more questions. So uh, one, one of the questions is, you know, um, preconception counseling. Uh, people who are trying to get pregnant, you know, will the vaccine, should they get it beforehand? And if they're in the middle of it, any effects on the teratogenic effects, you know, of the vaccine? No, not that we have seen at all. There's no, you know, there, there's no information, you know, that supports that particular claim. But certainly these are discussions to have with their healthcare providers, especially those that are specialized like yourself and OBGYN that can walk, you know, patients through some of those decision making uh, processes. And I don't think they've seen any data on affecting fertility rates. That's right. right. I don't think there is anything on that yet. So we'll be looking for, you know, I'm sure in the future. And um, as I mentioned, Pfizer just enrolled pregnant females. I think right. their, their threshold is between 26 to 36 weeks in gestation. So you'll get more information on that. Well. Right. Absolutely. Um, for that, though, do they have to, is it a national enrollment? 
Because if, if I have pregnant women who are getting the vaccines, they can look up Pfizer and then go into their registry. Is that how it's working? I'm not exactly sure. The okay. it just came, yeah, I think just came out on Thursday and they've already enrolled a number of, of women in it. But okay. I think it's looking at it from an international standpoint. Okay, good. So last question. It's a loaded question. Oh boy. <laughs> do you think we will be... bang. <laughs> Yeah, you're like, oh my goodness. So well, do you think we'll be going back to regular programming at our masjids, our Imam Barras in 2021? Yeah, I think first being, uh, you know, a woman of faith, I certainly, you know, look forward to the day where I can go back to being part of my community uh, in person. Obviously, everybody, I'm sure is tired of seeing everybody remotely through Zoom and, and doing the madlasas and, and the malad yeah. and like that through that way. Um, but certainly we will get to a point where we will be able to have uh, indoor events. And, and that may actually, um, you know, be sometime this year, maybe even in the summer. Again, it really depends on the surveillance and the information and the data that's being collected just uh, in the United States, as we get more to a level of what we call herd immunity, right? And it's not just about this herd immunity threshold, right? We can probably see some sense of normalcy and not to say that we're gonna start meeting in person again, but once you start seeing uh, more of a, uh, a general decline in severe disease, hospitalization and death, you'll have additional guidance that can tell you what you can and, and can't do um, as things evolve. But certainly we will get to a point and actually article uh, in the Atlantic called I think my uh, something about the summer having like a, a COVID-19 optimism about summer and it tells you what you can do you know once we reach to the point and, and some of those the summer activities so certainly we'll get we will get to that point sooner rather than later but it'll just take some time all right here we go I think we're done with all the medical questions Okay, <laughs> we're done with the health related questions. And before we sign off, um, it's a quick fire round. So whatever comes to your mind, here we go. Okay, people want to know what you're really like. Okay. <laughs> uh, sure. Out of my time. <laughs> you already said you already have kids. So but here we go. So answer the question with the first thing that pops in your head one word response. Okay. Uh, that, that's really then, difficult for me. I don't know. I know I had a, I was looking at these questions and I was like oh boy I don't know yeah. but I'm glad it's you not me okay <laughs> it's comforting all right so um New York or Maryland oh Maryland <laughs> staying that's where my family is from <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> staying in or going out staying in snowy days or sunny beaches oh I definitely prefer the sun yeah movie or book book Okay. Favorite way to unwind? Cooking. I love cooking. Yeah. Oh, we should have you over and you can cook for me. Yeah. So. <laughs> I'm not going to say it's going to turn out really good, but I it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. <laughs> Which is worse, stubbing your toe or biting your cheek? Oh, boy. I want to know who came up with these questions. <laughs> oh, more. oh, yeah. Uh, well, you know, that, that's a hard one because uh, I, would, I would say biting your cheek because it'll have an effect after you <laughs> exactly you won't be able to eat if you bite your cheeks so stubbing the toe <laughs> uh pick one camping hiking riding your bike going whitewater rafting in a boat oh boy okay i don't yeah. know uh so I, I never really done camping whitewater rafting what was the other option riding your bike or just um, yeah I, 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 yeah yeah uh favorite pet my favorite pet. So my kids are on my back of having a dog. We're not having a dog or a cat. We have a fifth. Um, I think my children are my pets. <laughs> so it's like, it's what I have. Yeah, my kids also yeah. want to have uh, a dog. And I'm like, no, there's no dogs. And I just yeah. can't stand the animals in the house. Anyway, that's just me. Yeah. Desi food or American food? Oh, desi food. Mm, lassi or faludo? Mm. Yeah, lassi. Nehari biryani or pie? That's a really hard one. Really hard one. I'll say all of the above. That's a yeah. <laughs> um, international destination you could go to more than once or you want to go or have been. Wow. Yeah. So uh, I think for, for me, I definitely enjoyed Hawaii. It's oh, yes. I just consider it international. I mean, that's domestic. It's part of the United States. Yeah. But uh i mean it's, it's a place i definitely do it in pakistan it's beautiful too yeah so um favorite binge show and it can't be your docu series okay? 
I will be honest. I've never really watched my docu series fully. It's one of those. I, I have a very hard time watching myself uh, on TV. I've rarely seen any of my media stuff. It's just okay. those personal things. Uh, so for for me, um, you know, I, I when it comes to watching mindless, something that's more mindless. Um, uh, I what what I've, I can't even remember. Um, I can't even remember the name. I'm sorry. <laughs> that's okay. But you know. You, everyone should watch your two documentary docu series that you have. The one on Netflix called "The Pandemic," I believe, and then on Discovery. I think it just aired last week, right? This past. So, week? Yeah. So um, the uh, COVID nineteen vaccine just aired two days ago, and it was yeah. aired on Science Channel yesterday. And I think it's going to air again today. So it's, that's new with Dr. Fauci, Dr. Collins. Right. And so I look forward to. Um, to actually seeing that one, the new one on Discovery. So thank you so much. It's been a pleasure, honestly, um, discussing everything. My goodness, I think we went, <laughs> we had the best <laughs> conversation, <laughs> highlighted everything. I so thank you so much. And thank My you pleasure. for our viewers as well for keeping us entertained with the questions. Yeah, no, so I'm curious, is it going to tell me about my personality? <laughs> I don't know. Okay. There's no there was nothing. I, I'm, I'm okay. scrolling. Is yeah. there anything that comes from this? And I don't think so. I think I just want to know what your likes are and your dislikes are. Interesting. No. So you're going to hear that on the media, okay? On your Twitter account, they'll be like, what? She did not like Paluda. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> I'm a lusty girl. <laughs> yeah, they'll be at it. All yeah. right. Well, thank you so much. My pleasure. All right. To you. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. A -bye. Bye. hundred years ago, a deadly influenza virus infected hundreds of millions of people, somewhere in the order of 50 to 100 million deaths. When we talk about another flu pandemic happening, it's not a matter of if, but when. A new strain of bird flu. This is definitely one of the most lethal influenza viruses that we have seen so far. It just takes one person to start an outbreak. It will leave its mark. The result would be hundreds of millions of people that would likely die. That's why I do what I do. We're making a vaccine that could treat all future versions of flu. This vaccine could eradicate influenza as we know it. <laughs> The problem so widespread, the World Health Organization is calling the refusal to vaccinate one of the biggest threats of 2019. A healthy child has the ability to build up immunity naturally. I know that what I do is important to my patients, but what am I doing to myself and my family? Within one month, the virus can spread throughout the country. A month after that, widespread throughout the world. The next pandemic is going to start, and we just don't know where or how, but we know it will. That poses an existential threat to us as a species. This is an explosive outbreak that's involved virtually everybody on the planet in less than a year. These infectious disease pathogens wreak havoc on humanity silently. I think it was terrifying for these scientists. It became clear that this was going to become a global pandemic to people who were paying attention. The devastation from this pandemic is incredible. None of us are safe until all of us are safe. We needed to have a vaccine if we were going to triumph over this threat. Nothing like this has ever been accomplished before. We just turned on all the burners and said, we've got to make a vaccine here. Not worrying about who is going to get the credit, just get it done. There was clear light at the end of the tunnel. The Vaccine, Conquering COVID, Thursday at 10 on Discovery and streaming on Discovery+. Plus.